Wouldn't it be great if you had a religion in which you were so in love with God that you couldn't contain it? You had to sing. You even had to dance. Let's talk about that. Hi, my name is Father Mike Manning. God bless you very much for watching the show. We have got a very interesting program for you today, one that perhaps you hadn't anticipated. We're talking about the importance of what it means to really love God in your heart. If you, if you really love God, well, you, you want to talk to God. You might even want to sing to God. You might want to even clap your hands. But you might want to break into dance. Wouldn't that be marvelous? Uh, it's not something that we don't find in the Bible. When I look in the Bible, I find, remember David dancing in front of the ark? He was so filled. And gosh, there are mentions of the Psalms where you should get a, a tambourine and you should smash the tambourine and you should dance in order to express the love that you have for God. And I, I think that Jesus, we, 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 there's nothing in the Bible that says this, but we do know from the Gospel of John that Jesus went to, um, to a uh, wedding ceremony, a, a Jewish wedding ceremony. Well, I can't imagine at a beautiful wedding ceremony a whole bunch of people sitting around looking at everyone else. You know what they did? The music started and everybody got up and danced and Jesus was dancing right along with them. And now we've got a wonderful dancer with us today. John, thank you so much for coming you, and being with us. It's delightful to have you here. Thank you. I'm delighted Your to be here. Your vocation is one of trying to express this sometimes stifled experience that we have of our love of God by kind of confining it into the, into the, into the liturgies that we have in the Mass. But you're allowing us to be able to see a new insight and a new love and a, an expression that's very biblical and very much in line with many, many a heart that's on fire with Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 I believe that entirely. In fact, I grew up in a, in a culture and in a tradition in which um, worship in the black community is definitely sung, praised, and danced. Yes. It's, it's very natural in that mm -hmm. context. So just by my own choice to be Catholic, it doesn't take away the authenticity of that expression for me. And I think the authenticity of that expression, when you begin to look at it and study it, for people well beyond the, the confines of the American black experience or even the African experience with all of the, the rather broad range of the African diaspora, the spread of African peop people throughout the world. So I think it's reclaiming is what it is. It's reclaiming something that is legitimately ours and that here in America has been, um, in a sense, uh, strangulated out of the American tradition. Why? Because why? What, 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 why? Puritanism. That Puritanism. Notion, that ah. notion that somehow or another I'm going to live this life outside this body. That my, my Christian life, my religious life, my spiritual life, somehow or another. My physical life. It, they have to be separated. And that's very hard to do. You know, I mean, I think that when you stop to think about it, you have to take all of you with you, yes, um, even yes. when you go to church or when you sit down to pray or when you kneel to pray or when you stand and pray. It is this body, this earthly coil, as Shakespeare would put it, that, you know, happens to come with you in that context. So, you know, I think it's, it's asking us to come back and to rethink ourselves and for Catholics, uh, at least from my perspective, to rethink ourselves in light of the Incarnation. We are incarnationalist. In what is that? What do you, what, I know. that what, what we do you believe mean? What do you mean? that God became flesh okay. and dwelt amongst okay. us. Okay. And we just got finished in, you know, uh, celebrating the other side of this, that he died and rose again. But he didn't just die in spirit. He died physically 
and then went with the spirit and with that body back to heaven. So, you know, it's a there's a continuity of thought, there's a continuity of theology from the very beginning to the end of the Christian narrative. And for me, I didn't know that. I, I have to confess, I didn't come, you know, sprung from the head of a theologian or anything like that. But I discovered it when I was in college and I took my course, my first course in uh, in Christology. I didn't even know such a study existed. But when you say Christology, what is that? That's the study, the study of, of Christ, Christ himself. Christ himself. And one of the things that struck me was the Philippians chapter two, verse six, mm. when it talks about how God emptied himself of his Godhead and put himself into the human form. But he was fully God and fully man, and that was the underscoring. He didn't just decide, oh, I'm going to live in this body and pretend to be human. He was no. fully human. Every, every aspect of our human existence, God has done, whether it's our heartache, right. our, our suffering, our pain, or even our separation. Exactly. And even, even the fire of love that he felt for his father Absolutely. that just burned in his heart. He was a very passionate man. He was a passionate man. Yes. And it wasn't just a matter of saying, oh, Father, I love you, I love you, I love you. Hardly. It got into his feet. It did, It got indeed. into his hands. I piped for you and you would not dance. Amen. All right, and it's repeated Ooh, twice. That's neat. Matthew and Luke. Yes. And the notion is that, and these are from Christ's own mouth, and it goes back again into the, the scriptures, but there are words within the context of the Hebrew scriptures that themselves reference some kind of movement, some kind of dance, and we've lost that. And so even the word Pesach, which is a part of the, the word for the, the, the Paschal um, celebration, Passover itself, there is a notion at one point in the derivation of the word that it was wrapped in a notion of movement and of dance. And you stop to think about the Exodus. You stop to yeah. think about what those people did. They didn't stand there and wait it's for moving. God to transport them from one yes, place. Yes, yes. They, moved. they moved. They moved. They had to. For 40, you know, 40 years, um, you know, there they are moving in the desert. And as they moved, they prayed. They, they encountered and, and felt that conflict with their own lives as it was growing. So, you know, all of this began to speak to me in my later years, uh, to say, this is why I do this. This is what it is that I and my dance company, The Valium of Dancers, um, are, in a sense, charged to do. And it's great, you know, to be here in San Bernardino. I, this was a homecoming for me. Oh, good. Um, when the diocese first became an independent di diocese, I was invited to dance at the ordination of Bishop Straling. The first and bishop the of San first Bernardino. The bishop of San Bernardino. A good friend of mine, a wonderful uh, man. He is, he is. And it was really an honor, but so right, to in some way or another try to lend or to enhance the prayer and the ritual of that event. It was underscored by the um, the idea, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And when we stop to think about that, what more passionate and dynamic person was there to do that than John the Baptist? And so I did a dance as the post-communion prayer called Baptist Cry. And it was a real punctuation, a very emotional one for me, but seemingly by all the reports that I got from the various publications that responded, that really thought it did do what it was supposed to do. It wasn't about me. It never is. Yes. You know, if it does that, then it's a worthless piece of choreography because it's not speaking or reaching out to anyone other than myself. This was to reach out and to touch people and to allow them to enter into, in that particular situation, um, the, the ordination of this this person who was going to set and trailblaze the Diocese of, of San Bernardino in a way that had never been done before. I, I'm very moved when someone can read the scripture well, and you can tell because they're, 
they're not just reading words, mm. but they're, they're relating to the experience of what the words are saying. And, and in many ways, they become a mirror to me of letting me know, exactly. you know who I am. Um, and I think that's what dance is about, too. And you, I, I like it when you said, and this is what think, I think of, of, telling the story of John the Baptist. You didn't even have to open your mouth, you know? But you were able to, to allow it to be something that your body expressed, and it's true, and it's real. There was a pre presentation of Swan Lake, and these, these wonderful dancers came in, and the opening scene, they closed up, and they, they were all formed in this beautiful white and, and, and black experience that was just marvelous. And mm -hmm. I, I, for two hours, I was just overwhelmed with the beauty of the passion of the people wanting to express with their bodies just what we're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And why can't we say, let's do something like that with our bodies with regard to saying, I love God. Mm. If I can be passionate about the, the beauty of the art of a ballet, what about the beauty of the passion of my love for Jesus and his love for me and wanting to respond to that. Because as it's we... not just words, Father. Yeah, it's precisely. It's not just words. It, it... And, you know, whether we take it from the secular point of view of saying, you know, that um, words are only one third of the communication because you have to add gesture in order to complete its meaning. If the audience had to close their eyes and only listen to my voice and not see yes. my facial expression, my hands, the rest of it, they wouldn't get half of the meaning, not even a third of the meaning of what I'm trying to say because it's communicated by so much more than just my voice. So that's important. Let's come back and let's allow ourselves to get into a little bit more depth of how this experience happens. And we want to see a little bit of your experience of what you're doing with your troupe and whatnot. So stay tuned. You're going to be blessed. I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things in life would be to have real joy, to, to have that peace that fills our life. Gosh, in the midst of all the conflict, the war, the division, the brokenness, the striving to be better than other people, oh, our hearts can be just torn up and we can't find the peace that has a real reflection of joy. And uh, not just joy as a noun, I want something that's alive. I like the word rejoicing. It's, it's making joy alive and real. I want rejoicing. And brothers and sisters, that's what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. God coming into our life with forgiveness, with peace, and real joy. Oh, I mean, it's, it's more than a whole bunch of money. It's a whole bunch of power, it's a whole bunch of satisfaction, joy, and the rejoicing that comes from it is what I want in my life. I'm thinking of St. Paul when he said, listen to this letter, he, something that he said to the Thessalonians. He said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in all circumstances give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to send this booklet to you. Rejoice always. I want you to get a flavor of that power, especially in your loneliness and sadness, and let the, the joy, the rejoicing flood you. For your gift of $2 or more, oh, you're gonna help us if you will, I want you to experience God's love, please. Do that right away. You're going to be enriched, you're going to be empowered, and joy can be yours. When we speak of uh, dance, one of my strong experiences in, in connection with, with, with mass was going to Ghana in West Africa. Now, I, I think you're, you're going you're gonna to understand what happens, but what happens is this. It's in a big, big football stadium in which everything is very open in the center, and they come and they put a basket right in the center of, like, you know, the 50-yard line. The music starts, and a line starts forming <laughs> with every person dancing with their money yeah. 
on the way to the basket, putting the money in, every, you know, this line, of, and then dancing as they leave from the basket mm -hmm. this way. And I looked at it and I said, wouldn't that be marvelous on a Sunday if we could be able to have a collection? With and how un-American. <laughs> <laughs> be a, joyful about what, partying with joyful. my money? And, and, and they, yeah. were just, they were singing and they were dancing as they came and they put that in and then they danced off. But it was such a wonderful time. And, yeah. and it just typified the beauty of what dance is about. It, it was the spirit and the joy and the life of the people. You know, You're called way. to it, and you can't contain yourself. I, I once, um, I, I said to you earlier, um, before the interview began, that I had spent some time um, dancing with March Champion, the MGM star, and oh. um, I, she was my partner for seven years, and she was working at the time uh, in a liturgical renewal in the Presbyterian Church. So as we went around and did a variety of different things at that time, uh, I did a dance workshop at a mission, uh, a summer mission in Montreat, um, South Carolina, I believe it is. I met an African woman there who told the story of how when she converted from whatever her uh, traditional religion was into Christianity, that she was told she could not dance. So here was this woman for whom dance was like drinking water. Yes. And she said to me, She's, by the time that the workshop was over, because we had a culminating worship service, she was in tears. Wow. And she thanked me for allowing her to renew her connection with the dance because she said for the first time in years she could truly pray. Wow. That's, that's an understanding that those of us who don't live inside that kind of experience on a regular basis, that we need to step back to hear, to feel, and to understand. Yes. And um, I was so moved because I had no idea, of course, that this was the effect that it was having upon this woman. So yeah, it's really important. Here in uh, Southern California, there's an annual affair called a um, catechetical congress. Um, it's a big thing. And one of the one of the real piece de resistance is the, the concluding mass. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been very moved when I've been able to be at the celebration that there's a wonderful combination and the openness to dance at a liturgical celebration. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? And sure. could you tell us a little bit about how you've been able, well, maybe in the Presbyterian church, but also in the Catholic church, to bring a sense of dance into the experience of worship? Mm. Um, when I first began to do this, it was accidental. Uh, I was a senior in college. Uh, I was a student at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. And you have to remember, I'm a native of Southern California. So Ooh, somehow- Minnesota another, in California. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was at St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, did not go there to study dance. I went to study psychology. My senior year, uh, I'd been working in the theater department and in the dance department doing a variety of things. I choreographed West Side Story and the sisters from St. Catherine uh, asked me if I would come over and choreograph half a sixpence. And one of them came up to me later and said, John, we're doing an experimental liturgy. And we wanted to know, Sister So-and-so is doing, writing some new music. Sister So-and-so is going to uh, write some poetry to uh, contribute. Would you like to contribute some dance? New idea to me, but I thought, sure. I thought at the time that it was a one-time kind of situation. And I really had not expected to return home to Southern California. I was off to Canada to become a psychologist in Edmonton. But when I came back home, I got back to my alma mater, Mount Carmel High School, and I was asked to then become a drama teacher, part-time. The part-time drama teacher turned into also working in dance and other things and got me connected back with one of your old haunts, uh, Verbum Bay High School, where I met someone who said, well, we have this, this monastery in the desert that really enjoys 
uh, dance as a part of the fall festival. They would call it the uh, Vespers celebration. So it wasn't a, a Eucharistic celebration, but it was a prayer celebration very much within the context of the Catholic tradition and the Catholic Benedictine tradition. That set me on an entirely different road that I don't think I would have ever known. Uh. It got me not only to St. Andrew's Abbey, where I'm an oblate, but also to uh, connections with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, as well as my connection with Marge and a variety of other things. Coming to the first Religious Education Congress, it was a very small deal. This was back in the late 70s, and both Monsignor Berry and Monsignor Torgerson had invited me and the company to do both workshops and to do presentations at those congresses. Now, some 40 years later, I'm still doing it. Wow. But the beauty is that each of the liturgies that is offered, not only the closing two liturgies, and the opening event. But the Friday night and the Saturday night liturgies are all embellished by some form of sacred movement, liturgical mm. movement. It is the term that we have embraced so that people can kind of push back from the fear of using the D word. And so, <laughs> um, as they do it though, it is amazing to see the power of movement and prayer visible in a room of 30,000 people or in a room of 500 people mm. because you can help transport them. This year, the gospel was the gospel of the transfiguration. I promise you, dance can be transfiguring if you surrender to it, if you stop fighting, and if you recognize that if you close your eyes or keep them open, and if you lift your hands or you move your hands to be expressive of the words you're saying, you're taken someplace else. You can do it with something as mm. familiar as the Lord's Prayer or as complex as a psalmatic response, a responsorial psalm. So, you know, it's about freeing oneself to be really in the moment with God, in the moment with one's faith, mm -hmm. in the moment mm -hmm. with Christ himself as he lives and breathes inside of you. And you can't have Christ inside of you, well, I guess you can, you can be dead, but it's kind of useless at that point, you know? You need to feel this, you need to respond to it in that way. And so I think that, you know, we've watched over the years, I've had, um, you know, Cardinal uh, Mahoney and now Archbishop Gomez, who have been very gentle and very kind, especially in terms of their um, permission I'll use that term, to, to allow this expression to at least have a safeguard within that space. It's not done broadly throughout the archdiocese, um, but it does occur. And it occurs in especially those cultural parishes where the people of the parish see and embrace that need, that, that opportunity to be a complete self, fully present and fully engaged in the prayer of the church, whether it's Eucharistic or not. We don't have to do it at the Eucharist. That's fine. The Eucharist has its own, its own forms, its own limitations, its own um, you know, sanctity in a variety of different people's um, perspectives. But we pray, hopefully, in a variety of other ways in a variety of other circumstances. And this is where we need to have that opportunity to extend our prayer through our bodies and into, uh, and into movement and dance. You, you give me hope, and, and also you give me a broader perspective of let's say, let's open our hearts that if we do love Jesus, mm -hmm. and if we do love the Lord, and we want to give ourselves to the Lord, I need to say yes in my head, I, I need to be able to maybe write something down, but I've got to be also able to start moving my body mm -hmm. as a very, and it's from the Bible, <laughs> it's there and it can happen. It can happen perhaps in the liturgy, it can happen perhaps outside the liturgy. But oh my, you, you're, you're opening up all kinds of hope Good. and all kinds of visions for people that are going to be able to hear through the, through the nation and around the world the power of dance. We're going to come back and we're going to be praying with some of the people that have written in asking for prayers. Would you, would you pray with us? Absolutely. Before? Okay. Stay tuned. We're going to be right back.
I have written a very special pamphlet that I want to send to you. Look at it. Rejoice always. I don't know about you, but we live in a world in which sometimes joy is far away. Oh, we can laugh on the comedy channel, but it's not just laughter, it's joy which can touch our hearts and change and permeate our whole being. I believe the power of God's love for us is the key to that joy, to that not just a stopping joy, but a rejoicing. It's, it's the words of St. Paul to the Thessalonians when he shouted out, Rejoice always, please, for your gift of $2 or more. I want to send this special gift to you to allow you to find keys, helps, to reach out and find the peace and the joy which is the foundation of a life in Christ. One of the most important things about dance is being able to express the love of God that I feel in my heart. Mm. And I want to express it with everything. I can, I can do it with holy water, I can do it with incense, I can do it with singing, I can do it with speaking, but I can also do it with dance. Mm. And as long as it's done with reverence and care, some of our fears, and I think a lot of people are afraid because sometimes dance can have a, a nasty, you know, it can be the sensual, mm -hmm. you know, a, a dirty thing that, that's not good. Well, that's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is this passionate love of God that I have in my heart that I want to express. Mm -hmm. Not only do I get to talk with people like yourself and, and your beautiful story and beautiful who you are, but people are, are sharing their hearts with us too and they're they're doing the action of picking up their telephone mm. or they're going to their internet and they're letting us know of their special prayers and petitions. Let me share some of them sure. with you and then we'll pray. We want to pray for you uh, as, as God saying, I love you, and you saying back to God, I love you, mm -hmm. and allowing that flower and that flame to start to blossom. Get in touch, pick up the phone, write a computer, let us know what you think, you know? Share with us those needs. This is from David. He's, um, he wrote it and he says he has a heart issue and there's a struggle with diabetes um, and his strength with his faith. Um, Armelia from South Carolina, you know, all my family, especially for my grandson to find a better job. Uh, Charlene from Alabama, uh, somewhere to live. <laughs> wow, here we are. Yeah. Uh, Anne-Marie from Texas, um, Lord help my marriage. Uh, and here's Kathy from California, her husband Bud, who has, has been diagnosed with advanced cancer. Let's put our hands here. Lord, we ask you to come with all the power and all the strength that you can bring. Touch our hearts, make our hearts dance with the joy of knowing you are present, you are healing, you are changing us. And may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.